what we will try to do today with this panel is not speak about AI in general, but try to locate it in areas that feel or are starting to feel the pressure. They're starting to feel the pressure in terms of the white collar work, in terms of professional service firms that see a number of the things that have built their livelihoods for a very long time come under threat from the possibility of doing many of these tasks by new technologies as they emerge. And the question is, what does that mean for the people that are working there? What is AI? What will it disrupt? How will it change the environment? And we've got uh, the privilege of having three people who can share complementary perspectives and are going to help us understand what's going on. So moving from your left to your right, we've got Gideon Smith, who is the European Chief Investment Officer of Rosenberg Equities, which is Axis IM Quantitative Equity Group, and is one of um, our uh, alumni. Um, and his uh, responsibilities do revolve around the application of a number of these technologies onto the uh, investment field. Uh, we've got Christine Foster, who's the Managing Director for Innovation for the Alan Turing Institute, where she's responsible for driving uh, forward the Institute's goal to translate its data science and AI research in real world uh, impact. And she told us that we should not hold against her that she's got an MBA from INSEAD. Um, <laughs> and has worked in the intersection of science and business. And we've got David Poole, the CEO of Symphony Ventures, uh, who's been uh, involved in running um, uh, a number of businesses on outsourcing and services, and is involved in his current role in trying to leverage uh, this technology in thinking about how he can add value and how he can identify the areas where most value can be added. So first of all, please join me in thanking them very much for being here. So um, we'll, we'll have a conversation and we'll then open up for Q&A. But let me start asking uh, each of our panelists uh, who brings a slightly different perspective. So uh, Gideon, you uh, did your PhD before everyone was crazy about technology, but you have been using technology and you've been a software developer in addition yeah. to a chartered accountant. And you've dealt with uh, these issues for a long time. AI by someone who needs to use technology to be in the cutting edge of its application uh, in the financial services world. What do you think is new and what is just the continuation of the stuff that we've already encountered before? Thank you very much, Michael. It's clearly an interesting question because on the one hand, the real thing that's changed is, is the job titles. So I'm going to talk about being a robo fund manager and we used to call that a quant. And uh, the job titles change from strategy engineer, portfolio engineer, uh, quant analyst, quant researcher. And now we just call ourselves data scientists. And most of my team feel they should get paid more as a result. Um, <laughs> but it's the, the really interesting thing for us is that it does feel like more of an evolution than a revolution. We've been banging on about using data and using models and uh, doing some form of machine learning for a very, very long time. And finally, people are interested in it. And it's very, very gratifying. Uh, I'd sort of make the case that, that this is indeed an evolution. The techniques we're using to analyze information are essentially forms of machine learning and have been for the last 20, 30 years. When you do regression analysis and you're, 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 you're modeling things to, to estimate uh, values and predict the value of companies or forecast earnings, we're using machines to, to do that process and, and using robots to do that. Um, there are a couple of things, I think, that are beginning to be game changers in this world. And, and, and the fuel behind all of this is the availability of new types of data. So people like to talk about big data. What we, when we think about that, it's, it's really a question of structured versus unstructured data. So the volume of information has, has transformed things uh, in, in, in the last few years. And there's loads of great statistics that I'm sure everybody's familiar with around um, how the amount of information is doubling and tripling every two months, six months, one year, depending on, 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 on what perspective you take. The other thing that is changing is the, the, the power of the models we get to apply to that information. So uh, I talked about sort of regression techniques. We do now get to apply uh, new, more advanced forms of modeling. So whether that's uh, neural networks or, or decision trees, random forest type techniques, and so on, we get to build more sophisticated models. Um, the, the limit in our particular industry on how far we can push this is that 
it remains an industry where I have to go out and sit across from clients and, and explain to them why I bought a particular stock. And, and, and that involves me, it's no good for me to say, well, the computer said so. I, I need to be able to explain the decisions the robot's making. And so that, that's creating a limit at this stage of how far we can, we can push the technology. Uh, but we can get into that further. As we, as we discuss. Well, let me, let me just try to uh, take the slightly more provocative uh, part. And um, uh, David, I'll turn to you. Um, let me replay part of what I think that I heard uh, Gideon say, which is that artificial intelligence at the end of the day is computational statistics. Uh, it is taking patterns uh, and rather than using the regression analysis, extrapolating it to see what it can predict, not being terribly fussy about why it predicts it, and then being able to decide as a result what you do, or to recognize what these patterns are, and whether the words and the technologies that we're doing them uh, may uh, appear to be more complicated, they come down the same thing. Uh, what do you think is novel, in addition to having much more data on the basis of which you can uh, draw these inferences that has the potential of changing how we do business? Well, you know, I think there are several things that are new, and, and I agree with Gideon to, um, to some extent. Um, actually, I think what's really new is that everybody's really talking about AI, and it's suddenly become fashionable and trendy to talk about AI. But a AI is not, as, you've, as you described, uh, it's not a single thing. It is a, a very, very broad spectrum, a discipline, and a range of computational calculations. Um, but the fact is it's now become the latest uh, buzzword, uh, and it's now the latest cloud. You know, we have a cloud, we have all sorts of things that have you know, have become buzzwords over the years. Um, so I think that, um, for me, everyone's talking about it, and there's almost a fear of missing out. So, you know, in my company, we spend most of our time advising on the implementation of robotic process automation, which is not AI. It, it's robotic in, in that we're, you know, essentially, we're training computers and software to do the work that humans do um, in using their company's applications. It logs into systems like a computer does, like, like a human does, sorry. Uh, and it performs tasks, and then it can, it can read data and it can input data just like a human would. So robotic in that it's replacing a human. Um, but generally speaking, you know, people, you know, our clients are saying, well, what about AI? I think mean, maybe I should, maybe instead of doing this robotic automation where I can get real benefits today, maybe I should wait until the AI stuff comes along. And actually, it's a, it, there's a lot of confusion as to what AI actually is. Um, so for me, I think, um, you know, there's more hype than reality in the, in the generic market. There's a lot of AI that is being used in very specific places. And actually, financial services is probably the one that's really uh, ahead of the game. What we're seeing a lot of is what I would call low-level AI, sort of the machine learning type activities where you're using uh, sort of, um, you know, trend analysis and you're using the... Um, you know, the, the, the understanding of big data and the, the inferences that you can create from big data to, to, to come to conclusions. Um, so we are seeing that, uh, and we are seeing AI used in the context of converting analog data into digital data, because robots are really rubbish at dealing with analog data. Um, so we have to get it into a digital format. So for me, the, the ability, you know, so one of the things that will drive, I think, the use of AI is the fact that we're now going to see a lot more robots being used to perform tasks. Then when you get robots performing tasks, you get an avalanche of data. And I think it's that avalanche of data um, that may drive a lot more of the machine learning type uh, capabilities and also some of the other AI that may come. Um, so that's, you know, that's my view on it. So Christine, we will have much more data as we think about what is the raw material that can train machines to learn, think, respond, predict. But if you take us a little bit more to the futurology, thinking about the types of applications, the nature of AI that you think has the possibility of transforming the way that we do business, what would you pick out? So first of all, I agree on the point that narrow AI is really this evolution from, you could call it operations research, you could call it applied, applied, applied statistics, or a lot of these fields. I would like to make the point first that what's really changing in the academic context um, and that it's not just hype, is actually working across those disciplines that the universities have traditionally held apart. So you can really think about kind of data science maybe forcing it in the first place between, you know, computer science, statistics, maybe a little bit of business. But actually when you think about AI um, and the uses of that machine learning, it's actually pushing across boundaries even further. So, you know, the social sciences are getting involved, the humanities are getting involved, you know, the ethical responsible use of data and AI isn't just a question for a statistician and a computer scientist, it's actually a question for 
the ethics department, the you know philosophy of humanities as well. Um, and so really the point is about you know all of the this being used um, in you know to create a world that we'd actually want to live in, not just the one that happens to come along. Um, but to but to answer your question, kind of what's really coming around the corner? One one useful way I think of thinking about even narrow AI is actually that it's one of these general purpose technologies. Right, a little bit like electricity, a little bit like a steam engine, these kinds of things, and it actually needs the associated, you know, related technologies, innovation theory, right? related technology actually make these things happen in business. And so one of the things you start to see is, yes, you can get a machine that can learn, you know, given a really good target, a big labeled data set, it can learn how to do, um, you know, uh, imaging for radiology. It can learn how to, you know, um, pick, you know, a find alpha, right? It can, le it can learn all these things, but um, but actually what you need is the associated technology next to it that grabs the data pipelines, that pulls these things together, that makes the explainable version for the person to go talk to his client, that, you know, that yeah. connects with the existing systems. And that's actually the part that's going to decide where the use cases are. Yeah. But we have our theories. I mean, obviously, we're working on what we think are the grand, at the turn, we're working on what we think are the grand challenges in general for society and the economy. Um, and for the most part, they aren't, you know, business process automation, right? right? To exactly. be fair, we're yeah. working kind of more in the more general purpose sense. Yeah. yeah. So let's hold the discrimination uh, question because I think that we will need to return to that because yeah. when we have decisions that are based on decision processes that relate to AI, we need to think about what it is that they are discriminating yeah. against and for, how the decision is made and how it is justified. Right. And procedural logic has been used for a very long time to make sure that we've got some checks and balances and that we don't lead to a substantively unfair economy. Very important, one of the issues that we do discuss actually in business schools in terms of the uh, ethical considerations in the uh, application of AI. But um, what I'd like to um, take us back to is another point that you mentioned um, he here, Christine, and that has to do with the fact that AI may be important because we see its impact uh, in confluence with other changes that are happening at the same time. Yeah. And you know, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm biased in, in the kinds of things that excite me as uh, a guy that looks at strategy and digital transformation, uh, but the uh, dissol dissolution of industry boundaries mm -hmm. and the fact that the traditional ways in which we had organized an economy in clearly distinct professions that have exclusionary rights that are given the domain and that they can organize them the way they, work, they want that are now slowly or perhaps more rapidly being eroded and that the division of labor in society is changing means that we're starting to say, well, hang on a minute, how else might we organize that? So financial services as a whole is facing the existential threat from blockchain and the possibility of creating distributed ledgers, but perhaps closer to home, and I'd like us to think about that as a specific test case, professional service firms mm -hmm. are starting to see their potential existence upended by AI. Uh, not only because you now don't need to have a junior, remember having worked very briefly in one of the now big four, I was doing mind-numbingly boring work mm -hmm. that was very highly paid uh, when I was in my 20s uh, in order to allow for a partner who was in his, then almost always, in his 50s to have an even better life. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's interesting <laughs> is that um, the pyramid uh, that is based on the fact that you needed someone who was highly trained on the criteria of the time to be doing uh, the legwork in order to support the pyramid structure that is the base of law firms, of audit firms, of many investment banks, of most consultancies, yeah. is now being challenged. So we have AI that is combining with the changes that have supported professions that can no longer justify themselves as professions, and organizational structures and pyramids that are no longer there and that risk being disrupted. How likely do you think AI, not by itself, but again, as you were saying, uh, Christine, combined with these other changes, do you see that potentially challenging the lifestyle, perhaps even the retirement of people in this room? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, 
question. One always hesitates to put a time frame on these things, but it's absolutely the case. And you know, we we certainly hear the objection from you know partners in law firms saying, "But how, you know, how will I grow new junior partners if I don't give them the associate level work to do?" Um, my counter to that would be, um, you know. We just as we would promise to say, you know, do our best to keep machines out of areas of work that are more suitable for people. I would ask that you also keep people out of areas of work that are more suitable for machines. Mm. You know, it wasn't okay when, um, you know, children were sent down coal mines because they were small, yeah. right? You know, <laughs> and it's also in some sense, you know, and kind of a little glib about it, but it's also not okay to ask, you know, somebody whether young and ambitious for a short period or somebody, you know, kind of stalling out in a career to spend 35 years doing something repetitive that's better done by a computer. I mean, we, um, do, we do see that quite a lot in our client base. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly if, as you look at professional services firms, you know, the, the law firms are starting to employ e-discovery, which was, you know, that was the thing you always had junior people plowing through, man, you know, old cases and whatever. So there's a lot, a lot of sort of legal um, software which is now replacing that work. Uh, in the audit firms the same. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of our clients, and I think actually um, uh, Gideon's also mentioned this before, where they're actually employing humans now to train AI. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here feeling slightly, <laughs> slightly guilty because we were discussing this just before. So on, on, on the one hand, um, I think it will require new business structures and new, new ways of organizing and, and, and new ways of, of managing the value in the organization. And in my own firm, I'm very conscious that we set out building a very, very flat um, hierarchy and, and people are encouraged to not think in terms of um, their job titles and their job roles and encouraged to look beyond that. At the same time, we've just created more grunt work than we've ever had before because we're asking our team of interns to start labeling um, Edgar filings. We want them to read through the financial filings and categorize paragraphs of text uh, with, a, with a, 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 a set of topics that a, a, a robot came up with through some unsupervised learning, and now we need to build a, tra a data training set. So suddenly, we have all this blue-collar work that's required to be done, and that, that's quite unusual, I think, mm. in now, the organization. I think if I may, just one of the, I mean, one of the trends I think we will see here is that, you know, in professional services and as people are trying to go up the ranks, we will see the emergence of the um, the AI assistant or the robotic assistant um, and that ability to coexist with a robot or an AI sitting beside you I think will be the way that it will be done mm. and I guess a lot more work will get will be done by fewer people so the problem is how many get to the top of the pyramid yeah. uh, and then which ones. But also, sorry we also you, you mentioned the term sort of narrow AI and again for the at least the foreseeable future, this AI will develop in very narrow streams and it will re re replace certain uh, <laughs> individual functions and, and, and individual value chains. The value then will be in the gaps and, 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 mm. and that's where I imagine we still need people to, to, to work and, and, and live in a way that we haven't perhaps done so right. in the well, past. That's exactly what happens, right? So, you know, the kind of famous example, why are there so many more bank tellers? It's not necessarily because retail banks are growing, right? But everybody knows, I think it's Otter, David Otter's work on, on this. It's because actually it, 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 it's a lot, um, if any of you are kind of palm people, kind of, it's, it's, in some ways it's kind of moving the bottleneck around, the bottleneck not being the rate mm -hmm. of production, but actually quality. So when you get these particular tasks that are, that are perf you know, not perfected, but optimized, with machine learning, it just moves the bit, you know, exception handling that needs to be done by someone else and can actually make those jobs a little bit more valuable even if they are repetitive. So True. it just moves it around. So the, the, the questions of where value is are going to be changing yep. as the simpler things become standardized on the basis of what machines can do. On the other hand, we have another change especially relevant for professional service firms. Um, the imagery of simply us moving to ever more interesting jobs to do as the simplest ones are done by machines that can understand the patterns and give a very quick answer um, uh, might make sense if, for instance, the ratio of labor to capital was stable. If you think about professional service firms now, we're having a rather different story when you need to start investing in technology rather than having people that will be working and expecting that the rewards will come in a pyramid that is structured for the up or out. So the interesting uh, uh, challenges that may emerge, certainly for professional service firms, is whether the organizational structure that they have uh, kept, the idea of the partnerships and the idea that you're going to be you know, slaving away and then you're going to have a comfortable life later on, not for everyone, but that's the reward we're going to promise, whether that's going to be tenable 
And if that's not tenable, then what's going to pay for this investment? And if that needs to pay for an investment, can we even be a partnership? And even if we're not a partnership, do we need now debt? Because we need to start having the engines of production that will start looking like uh, a different sector. And even if we do, what are the other sectors that we're competing with for the very same activities? So um, uh, let me sort of uh, throw a bit of a, of, of, of a left fielder here and ask you whether you see technologies, new technologies, that are helping us redefine what the underlying business activities are, what is the appropriate scope of organizations. Because if you think about the impact to the firms that employ uh, um, white collar, or if you think about white collar as having the exclusionary right of doing one job, if that's being challenged, that's a pretty mighty uh, uh, issue to contend with if you've got a white collar job, because you don't have the certainty that I have the exclusive privilege within my realm, because someone else with an AI-enabled technology can start playing in my field. Do you see that as a Absolutely. plausible challenge? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And I think, and I think if, even if you look at something like strategy consulting, I mean, what, you, what people spend a lot of money in strategy consulting is a research. You know, go out and research a market and tell me where I'm placed in that market and how my business model might work and then come back with the answers. And, and you have you know, very expensive consultants from all over the best business schools doing that stuff. But that stuff is just data. You know, it's yep. knowledge. It's been done. Business models are understood. There's no new business model. The business models are understood. The strategies, the decisions, the, um, the levers of success in every business model is now known and programmed. So you could, you know, who knows? Maybe you will be able to buy your strategy consulting, let's call it strategy as a service, from Amazon. Um, or anybody else that's got enough capital to invest in the technology. And I think that, that is you know, a, a reality that we will face. I think anybody who's seen strategy consulting over 20 years would say, you know, roughly what the case team used to produce in the first three months is now done kind of at the, at the pitch proposal stage, yeah. right? I mean, that, right. that's just that's known. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, kind of the primary, you know, data sets, those market, you know, kind of this flourishing of the, the you know, these market insight things that actually make that yeah. first bit easy and trivial. Um, so they kind of moved along from that. Um, but, but the interesting thing about the employment, though, is, is kind of, you know, every, We've seen this over and over again with various, you know, industrial revolutions. These kinds of things is is actually so employment eventually, you know, comes back high, but actually you get this kind of wage stagnation, right? And that's the bit to worry about yeah. when you kind of combine that with expensive post-secondary education mm -hmm. across a wide, mm -hmm. you know, segment of society, with then um, what is it is Engels gap or kind of that wage stagnation that happens. So yes, there could just be employment, but good jobs are harder to come by. Um, and it's harder to make the case for kind of multi-year degrees. Yeah. And what does that need to look like? So I'm now feeling guilty because I, <laughs> I, I can't help but put my investor's hat on and yeah. worrying less about society, but worrying more about the types of firm we're going to invest in and how we're going to value them. And yeah. Yeah. we've been thinking about how disruptive the technology will be and how that will change value chains and business models and how we value companies. The one area we've tended to avoid is professional services because they're structured as partnerships. But as you say, we, I can imagine them needing to finance themselves differently. Yeah. And in the past, when you talk about investing in people, I'm not going to be investing in people. I'm going to be investing in virtual assets. How do I value data? How do I value the big data? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's certainly how you justify the valuations of companies like Amazon and Google today. But as I imagine a professional services firm coming to market with a wholly new disruptive business model financed through equity, yeah. how am I going to value them? Mm. I think some of the metaphors we use too are unhelpful. You know, when you're valuing these companies yeah. and kind of data assets, you know, people often talk about kind of data is the new oil, data is the new gold. I mean, I just think that's just kind of the wrong. And it's it's unhelpful because you can kind of get these you know goblins starving on top of their own piles of gold, right? You know, not doing anything <laughs> with it because it's so valuable you couldn't possibly. You know, and so I you know I would encourage again not just to put out a metaphor, but kind of data is more like water these days, you know, or, sorry, water, we're, um, <laughs> um, we're, you know, we're, we're bathing in it, we're kind of all around it, and, you know, and actually the question you have to ask yourself, and I guess also as an investor in legal firms, is kind of what is your part in the ecosystem, you know, what are you collecting, what are you kind of putting back, where do you, you know, it, it, it works a little bit differently, I think, when you don't worry about it as gold. Well, I'm certainly going to, I'm going to challenge the metaphor, because okay. I'm, I'm with you that oil is the wrong one, because this is not a, a scarce resource, there's loads of it. Mm. Um, but unlike water, it, it needs to be, it, like, like oil, it does need to be refined, mm -hmm. it needs to be processed, because if you're going to extract value out of it, in, in any sense, if, you, if you're going to use it in your business processes, in its rawest form, 
information is really hard to, to, to use, yeah. and that's why you need robots and computers. So, Gideon, uh, I, I thank you very much for uh, convincing us that strategy is going to be more necessary than ever. As a strategy, <laughs> I'm saying that, good job. Um, yes, I do, I do think that a, a more thoughtful application and not taking the existing categorizations for granted mm. and trying to figure out how you're adding value, where you're adding value, rather than simply comparing yourself to your peers, mm. thinking that if I am better than any of my direct competitors on mm. you know, the metrics that we used to have, I'm going to have a comfortable life um, is very important. And I think that this is a part of changes that we're seeing throughout the way that society is organized that is much more important. And uh, a way to illustrate that, and I'd like us to shift a little bit to uh, another area that I think is starting to feel the pressure, will feel it more, and will take us back to these ethical considerations, is changes in healthcare. One of the possibilities that AI has is patent recognition. It's a major field of application, uh -huh. and obviously one of the things that we see in the growth of AI is the possibility that it'll help guide patent recognition that relates <laughs> to health, because as society, we are spending more than what we can afford on healthcare. Uh, endogenously, because of course it's much cheaper to die from a heart attack and sort of um, uh, not be in the health system, and we are increasing the cost in, in, in that regard. But as we're thinking about uh, the way in which that is going to change it, and perhaps even change the value add, or even the need for a doctor, we do know that individuals are not very good in pattern recognition. We have known well before AI that simple beha behavioral models uh, may predict better causes of actions than what doctors have, there's an interesting open question of what that means for professions that used to be privileged, like doctors in particular. Interestingly, not nurses that are not challenged by AI, right. doctors who are challenged by AI, as well as the hospitals that employ them. So let us shift now to this other sensitive area and think about what that could mean. Uh, what do you think uh, AI could mean in the organization of healthcare or other social services that may find themselves also challenged in the white collar component or part of the value adding process? Well, I mean, we're, our, sure. we're already seeing in treatment plans. So just as, you know, so many um, commercial organizations have gone to ever more de-averaging, you know, targeted marketing communications, you know, offers to their individuals. It's the same. It's starting to be the same with tr um, treatment plans, right? Personalized um, and finding those kinds of patterns that were impossible. So the piece of work we're doing, the Cystic Fibrosis Trust, it's kind of, a, in some ways, answering the question that many adverti advertisers, brands like to know. You know, I know half of my advertising is wasted. Which half? Tri you know. The more meaningful question on cystic fibrosis trust is, you know, you have a finite number of lung transplants. Some of them work very well at various stages of people with CF and some don't. So, you know, how do we allocate the scarce resource across? So, I mean, things like that that just, you know, the ability, right, the genotypes, the phenotypes, and understanding exactly how this will play out. Yeah. And also digital simulation. So, so modeling techniques that you, you know, might take for granted in the business sector haven't always been used in, in medical. And so I'm kind of running through the scenarios um, in a way that you, you know, you're entirely used to, but the medical community so, isn't. So I, 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 for me, I'd almost take the technologies for, for granted. It's there. It will absolutely improve medical diagnostics and yep. Yep. improve our ability to test drugs and do simulations and so on. Um, there's this interesting question, and you often get it when you, you meet a consultant and they're the best consultant in the world and you trust their judgment, but they, they've got no bedside manner. Mm. The value of that bedside manner is going to become increasingly important, as, as, as you say. It's why nurses will be less threatened than, than, than doctors. But as you, as you analyze any business, any white collar area, you can divide the activity into the repetitive pattern recognition, doing the same thing over and over again to build expertise, which the robots will absolutely do. Mm. There's the trust, human interaction, human relationship aspect. And therein lies this interesting question of how much of that, how, how important is that to us? How much of that will we give up in favor of having a better, cheaper delivered service? And, and, and that will, I think, determine how, where, where the roles really remain. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting analogy with pilots and doctors. I don't know if you've read that work. But um, you know, the reason that air travel is now one of the safest things you can do is because every time there is even a minor incident, it is analyzed in extreme depth as to what happened and why it happened. Was it, a, was it an issue that was? you know, with the pilot and, you know, the way he was thinking or the mood he was in or what he ate the day before. Whereas with doctors, the, there has never been that. Right. 
So doctors, you know, if someone dies, well, they were, they were sick, you know, whereas I think now there's, you know, the lack of analysis of what actually went wrong right. and what you could have done better. And you hear about procedures that are very, very simple procedures that no one really studied why they were going wrong 40% of the time. Yeah. And then one guy, one doctor just said, okay, I'm going to research this and I'm going to look at that in some detail. And he issued a very, very simple change in the procedure. And now there's a 99.9% .9 success rate of the procedure. Mm. And it's just that ability to analyze data and to feed that back into the future. And I think that's where AI will play a huge part in medicine, right. is we'll start to really understand the whole circumstance of the treatment. It's that full-time statistician ops research post exactly. that's <laughs> sitting right. I think it's Toronto's so it's Children, Children's General Hospital. Right. I think that's where they're doing it. And, yeah. It's, yeah, and the question is integrating it. So let me pivot the discussion a little bit, because that takes us to the question of skills. Uh, and takes us to the question of what are the necessary skills and how do we integrate skills in what has traditionally been white collar uh, occupations. There's a big question of the business model, uh, which we're not going to be touching anymore, or the organizational structure, which again need to be seen. But given that we are a business school and we think a school and we think about skills, let me just mention a couple of, uh, of observations. And I'll start on what you just mentioned about planes. Uh, speaking with people um, in uh, the uh, airline industry, one of the concerns that I think uh, exists is that there is a short-term benefit of having about 80-85% of the flight being run by uh, the uh, built-in pilot and about 15% of the actual pilot. But the problem is that most airlines find that as a cost-saving device. Now, the problem is that your uh, automatic pilot stops working when something strange happens, when you have birds that stop the speed sensor that is central in allowing you to figure out what's going on. The computer says, sorry, mate, no data. Take it over. I don't know where to go. Uh, and the problem is that an average pilot or a pilot that does not know how the plane reacts is not going to do. What you essentially need is someone that is much better than the average pilot in terms of the experience. Two implications on that. First, a bifurcation of the people that need to be very skilled, technically, in what they do. Uh, and thus, the average skill doesn't buy you dinner the way that it used to. And the second, <coughs> lack of possibility of exercising some of these skills so that you can use them when this is really necessary. Mm -hmm. When the existing uh, machine system that has been trained in an existing structure <coughs> no longer works. And you know you can think about that more precisely in financial markets, in algo-created messes, when we, the machines really thought that they got it. And then some disturbance that they have not seen within their observation comes in, and they don't know what goes on, and then you see the index fall down. Why? Because they're following the best that they can think that they can do. And the whole thing goes haywire, and there is nowadays someone that is able to pull the plug saying, something seriously wrong happening, pull the plug. So first, let's think about this issue of uh, the potential sleepwalking towards disaster <coughs> that does exist in these cases. And second, we'll think about the integration of that. But what do you think about these potential issues of risks or skill shortages or the sleepwalking towards disaster that AI might potentially engender? On the one hand, there's incredible improvements we can make in uh, Safety, you, you, you describe the process where simple procedural improvements or an automated improvements can, can, can deliver much better results, much safer results. Uh, but then you have the fat tails, which is where the risk lives. Um, I talked about dividing, thinking about your work in terms of the automated repeatable part and the human relationships part. There is this third part, which is the uh, cognitive inspiration, ability to cope with never seen before circumstances. Um, and I know I, I, I share the concern that how does one build those skill sets and maintain that knowledge uh, where, where people don't get to work through an industry? I don't have the answer. Well, I mean, everybody worries about this technological enfeeblement, right? The kind of this notion that, you know, um, uh, you know uh, so for instance, I can't find my way around London without a smartphone because I won't, you know, Right, my experience of that is all, only with a smartphone, and this is considered a problem. But when you kind of take it in the longer sense, it's you know, um, many of us probably can't you know hunt or grow our own food and those kinds of things, right? So, so for the most part, we kind of say there's a certain element of you take a certain risk 
um, that we are kind of this collective species and these things, you know, kind of um, the specialization works in, in general. The other thing too, really specifically on um, kind of these kinds of high um, complexity, you know, only occasional sense jobs, they're actually, <laughs> Interestingly enough, AI is actually another helpful piece of tech there because actually pilots go through a lot of simulation training, you know, and actually, you know, the thousands and hours that they have don't actually represent all the kind of cases um, that they could possibly encounter. And so actually kind of dreaming up, if you will, ever more random, ever more unusual situations to do in simulation. So there's, some, there's probably a role some way in that the, the pilot job maybe looks different as well as the ground, um, the air control uh -huh. looks different because they're actually going through a lot of different simulations and actually what they do on the job most of the time doesn't matter. And one of the questions you ask a little bit is, um, you know, trains, right, you know, why aren't there more driverless trains? I think this is really kind of a social question. We just feel more comfortable knowing there's someone at the front. But um, as we know, you know, people, people can't always be trusted to do the right thing either. <laughs> um, and so for the most part, all these improvements, you know, we've seen in our cars when they kind of anti-lock brake a little bit before we, you know, all these kinds of things, they're generally making us safer. Um, so if we can't accuse a goat, we might accuse a human. It's much harder <laughs> to accuse a technology, I guess, uh, in yeah. terms of what, what the ills, ills have. But let's yeah. sort of shift to perhaps the last question before we, uh, uh, set of questions before we open that uh, up. And that has to do with the skills that will be needed. We've spoken about the implications that AI has in transforming uh, a good part of uh, what will probably happen in terms of white collar jobs. Uh, what are the things that will be needed? There's, uh, you, one might say that you need to have um, statistics or uh, computational understanding that is embedded in all of the professions, or you may think that you need a combination of the two, or you may want, you may think that intuition, as opposed to the patterns that can already be, be recognized, is what's going to be needed, or all of the above. What do you think uh, things uh, stand? Um, so. Uh, uh, David, what would you say? Uh, so, so it's very interesting. I almost feel like this bifurcates. I think on the one hand, you need a lot of people with a lot of very technical knowledge that know how these uh, AIs, these robots work. On the other hand, you know, the things that AI and robots are very bad at are the things that humans might be very good at. So the empathy, the emotional intelligence, the, um, the ability to care for somebody in a, mm. you know, as a human. Um, and I feel like those are, they're both critical sets of skills. Whether you can combine those, uh, I'm not sure. But I think that, you know, as we move uh, into this sort of new world, um, everybody needs to understand technology. And I mean everybody, because I don't, you know, even caring professions, I'm sure, will be using technology in different ways to make the care easy. So, so for me, I think it's, it's about um, you know, really understanding technology, but if, you, if you're in the caring, empathy, uh, emotional intelligence world, which is everything that the computers and the AI is not doing, I think you should be good at that. And I think that, you know, that those are areas that we should focus on. So Gideon, uh, you employ people that need to be a boat. How do you think about their skills? <laughs> I, 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 as we hire staff and I say to my team, I, I, I say the same thing to them that was said to me 20 years ago when I joined my firm, which was, I was told very, very clearly that my objective, my goal in life was to make myself redundant, was to automate my job away, and that give me something more interesting to do instead. And that has stood me in good stead throughout my career. And I think that ability to analyze tasks, analyze work, identify what is the repetitive bit, that ability to do that type of analysis, that's, that's valuable. And the interesting thing is, so the stuff I used to do, reading earnings announcements, the computer does that. The, uh, building these spreadsheets, the computer does that. That's, that's easy to automate. There's been these really interesting new uh, things we spend our time doing. So organizing development teams, organizing software teams, managing projects and deliverables, these are intrinsically human problems. We've had to get really good at that and spend more time doing that than doing the repetitive work. So I think that, that this, for, for the foreseeable future, Mm -hmm. Whilst we're still talking about intelligent automation rather than artificial intelligence, right. there's, there's, there's plenty for us to do. Mm -hmm. So, Christine, what's your sense about what the future holds if these are the current uh, trends? What do you think the skills that need to be invested in for the people that would like to have a successful career in what color would be? Yeah, well, so two things. One is um, more of a Turing Institute view 
which is actually thinking about how education probably needs to be parceled out across people's entire lives. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean, you know, kind of the degree and then kind of setting the path and then kind of occasional, um, you know, courses, but um, kind of much more meaningfully for people who are going to be in kind of knowledge work, kind of that um, continuing upgrade. And then another um, from um, kind of just a Christine view, just my view on my own, is really um, when you think about the value assigned to these tasks that computers are notoriously bad at, navigating through a cluttered space, manual dexterity, showing empathy, understanding what someone else is feeling, those kinds of things, um, it really will drive a change, I think, in what's considered valuable. And I think when you think about some of the questions, you know, some of the research also around the gender pay gap, uh, th those kinds of questions. It's if if some of these cognitive tasks that um, came with you know degrees and white collar jobs, cognitive tasks, um, you know, were kind of doled out to a certain proportion of the population, and these other tasks kind of tended to go to some others. It, it changes, I think, what we value and whose work gets paid, mm -hmm. you know, and whose work gets recognized. And we, I think, we're going to feel very differently. Um, and it's kind of part of the the whole debate going on over kind of what, you know, what fairness is, I think, in this economy. And I think we're pretty clear, all of us, that we'd like the people to come out on top <laughs> of the computers, right? Like, that's a pretty easy first principle to yeah, agree yeah. to. Well, and um, I think that we're wrapping this part of the conversation uh, by uh, coming down to the view that AI will have a very significant impact, is going to have an impact on existing uh, professions, their boundaries, their business models, their organizational models, the skills that are needed, the future skills that are needed, the time that you will uh, be able to live off them or within an existing box. And it seems that being much more proactive in questioning the box where you are and brokering solutions across is going to be uh, much more important uh, than it was. Now, with that, let me open up and uh, we'll take uh, questions uh, for the 15, 20 minutes that we've got until we wrap up. So if I can see show of hands, we're going to have a quasi-random distribution uh, of airtime. More questions than uh, statements. Uh, and let's start in the back and then in the front here, and then we'll shift to the left side. Uh, hello, uh, Alan Coftry, Tech Option. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I was reminded of a, of a, a story for a, an eminent computer scientist in the 1980s was showing the sort of first graphical user interfaces, and he was horrified uh, that he'd sp they'd spent 30 years teaching computers rudimentary languages, and now we were going to reduce our interaction to finger pointing. Um, <laughs> Years later, I think the the you know how many people actually do any meaningful programming of computers, and in a management and skills environment, um, you know the average average information I receive is not data or an algorithm; it's a PowerPoint slide. What are we? What are we? You know, are we really going to be able to jump forward in the in the way that you've described without uh, causing mayhem even among this community? <laughs> I'm with you. I think there will be a lot of disruption and a lot of mayhem. And, and, and I like the way you characterize it in terms of, we, it's, it's good to think about the channels of information and how <coughs> narrow they are. Um, but again, I would encourage us, as we're making business decisions, um, where, to, to analyze, again, where is the value? Um, what can I offload to a repetitive process? What are the decisions I'm really making? And, and, and what do I need to be doing versus allowing a robot to do it? I'm, yeah. I mean, McKinsey talks about this role of kind of the translator of all this kind of a AI output. I don't know if they're I don't know if they're right about that. The sense that kind of this work gets done by the computers, and there's somebody's job who it is to kind of read it and then interpret it and maybe put it in PowerPoint. I feel like that's an interim step, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that will be a big role. You know, 15 years, it'll be the hottest job, data science translator. But I think that goes away. And actually, one of the things I think that maybe Gideon's already feeling is is actually the the feeding, nurturing, and caring of that machine learning system, giving it that really good labeled data set, making sure that that represents what you're truly trying to make it learn, actually is a more important role. And I know it's buried in the depths of data engineering or IT in some of, some of these businesses, but I, I'm not sure it's being thought about the right way. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, what you see happening, if you, if you look at, um, at the level of, of firms, the firms that are more successful are not the ones that are advancing the technologies but that they are using the technology as the thin edge of the wedge 
to change industries and business models and the way that money is being made. So I think that what we are already seeing in, is a manifestation of the stuff that we've been talking about. At the level of the individual, if you move, uh, move to what they can do, I think that what uh, is going to happen is that a number of people will want to keep the certainty that a professional, well-defined professional trajectory looks like. And I think that this is, unfortunately for psychological stability, on its way out. It's not going to be easy. People like certainty, they like routine, they like the possibility of being and doing the same stuff. And the message that we're giving is that that's not going to serve you well because the time that you have an exclusionary principle and the right to continue in a long line of work is probably going down. And that's kind of what we see already. That's going to be amplified. And I think that an entrepreneurialism, both at the level of individual career and at the level of which way am I adding value, is going to be more important. So, you know, you want to call it leadership, call it whatever you want, but it'll combine the technological skills with the market application. And I think that this is the, ne the nexus where more value will be created. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have always some less attractive and probably more short-lived jobs which will, are going to be part and parcel of the gig economy that increases the bifurcation between the boring stuff, whose content will change, and the more exciting stuff. That will raise another question, inequality distribution of income. But we haven't even touched that because that's uh, <laughs> raising yet more questions. We have another question here, and then we'll move on the left side. Thank you. Patrick Spencer from Baird. Um, just on the productivity side, you know, Christine, you mentioned about the Industrial Revolution and uh, the productivity that came from that. Did, that did create more jobs. It did create more wealth per capita, per capita. What you're proposing this evening is perhaps less jobs and on an ethical side, less, you know, less wealth. So in a populist world, is AI damaging or is it actually helpful? I think most of the forecasts say more jobs, actually, but different jobs. So I think so far, mo most are coming out on the side of net jobs, but of course they're shifting around. I think, I, I think the experts would say that what's different this time might be the speed, um, right? That, that it, you know, it, it, the change, right, from the general purpose technology to kind of the associated things with it and the full adoption is, is happening faster than a generation, and that's going to cause bigger problems. But it, I think all forecasts are saying net more jobs and net more wealth. Um, Sorry, just to be a bit skeptical. When the previous revolution was happening, the Luddites were not voting. <laughs> they literally did not have the right to vote. The Luddites now yeah. have the right yep. to vote. Yep. They have found leaders that are emboldening them and giving them what they want to hear. I'm a little less optimistic <laughs> on the civic front. That's different. <laughs> I wanted to um, touch upon the point that Christine raised, which is the spreading the education over one's lifetime. And in particular, based on my personal experience, I think at the moment there is a bit of a a lack of options available. So you have either highly specialized crash courses like how to build a website, or you have very sort of high level introductory courses on various websites like Coursera, which give you a bit of an, okay, this is how it kind of works, but you don't really understand and you don't gain the skills which are transferable. So you don't really have the equivalence of chartered financial analyst certificate for a data science or executive MBA for data science. So my question to you is maybe you have heard of or you know, know some examples or some courses or some tools which you could recommend or you know, in general, how do you see this education landscape evolving over the next uh, decades? Thank you. Well, I kind of want to, you know, my colleagues who hire people, how are you judging the talent coming in? How are you evaluating? What are your touchstones? So I've got to, um, got to be a little careful here sitting in, in, in LBS. So I did, did my <laughs> MBA and I, I got my CFA, but as somebody who basically, my, my hobby at the moment is doing Coursera courses, I would not underestimate the value of a breadth of, of knowledge. Like, it, it, you're never going to be an expert, but, but the value in being able to bring together different disciplines, I, th I, I think is huge. So what I look for in my, in, in, in my team is that ability to think outside the box and think outside their narrow confines of what they've learnt. And, and the truth is a, a CFA is less valuable to me than somebody who's done half a dozen machine learning, data science, text analysis courses on Coursera, because they, they'll be able to talk to the, the real pointy head geeks and, and, and manage them, and, and, or be able to get, extract value from them. 
Yeah, and I mean, I and you know, not in this role, but before when I ran data science for a fintech startup, I hired one person who hadn't finished his undergraduate, but he had put himself through a kind of self-design one year's master's, and it's a, it's a complete pain. Um, but a lot of it was Coursera, and he also just showed us his GitHub, mm -hmm. right? So you could literally yeah. run. I mean, if that's not a better kind of more meritocratic way than the kind of panel interview, I'm not sure what yeah, is. You know, for sure. I think that ability yeah. to that ability to learn new things rapidly. I mean, it is all about the pace of change. So, you know, the way that we look at technology today is going to be very different in 10 years' time, and we have to be able to adapt. So, you know, doing a coding course in C plus or a website. I mean, we we just won't build websites like we do today in 10 years from now. So, it is about just having the ability to learn, and I, I think those kind of resources. You'll get them from different sources. I mean, the university, yeah. traditional university courses, just won't exist in the same way. I mean, you will we'll have measures of, you know, at, of, of achievement academically, but I think they'll be chopped up in, in very different ways. Absolutely. Being but, able to write SQL is kind of a commodity skill right, right. now. Well, but but the differentiator is, you know, can that person, you know, operate in the kind of agile software development environment, for instance? And right. so actually, well, those are all the kind of really. But but I would I'll take it further than that. I would I would say skills. that in a few years from now. Nobody will be coding in Fair. C, OK? Yeah. What they'll be doing, it'll be very low code. Or there's somebody will be coding the low code well, programs in C, but pe people will be developing yeah. new business models, new ways of working, but without doing the coding, without having a need for agile. Coding's a small part of it. They do it, yeah. Yeah, they do it on their iPhone, I don't the, know. But yeah. the, 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 the trick with agile is actually it's bringing together the multidisciplinary teams. Yeah. yeah. Is that the coding is only one small part of it? True. Well, although one of the challenges is that, of course, in the beginning, when this is very scarce, saying that you can do it and showing basic evidence is going to be enough. Then the question is, how will you start ranking them when mm. that's not so scarce that mm. you can identify it in the naked eye? And one of the things that you know, even we are trying to do in in, in a place like uh, like LBS in terms of discussions going on in faculty board and appointments committee and you know all these these other very old style institutions mm -hmm. that we have um, is uh, you know how will we be adding value? Mm -hmm. What do we need to change in the curriculum in terms of the type of learning, in terms of the skills that need to go in? And of course we face all the inertial issues that any other organizations are, but at least some of the questions are being asked. David. So I'm um, David Lancefield, uh, uh, PwC Strategy, and I'm one of the redundant partners you uh, referred to, if, <laughs> if not quite in the age group yet. <laughs> but I want to talk about something else. I could talk about professional services, but I'm, I'm interested in um, the impact on boards and exec committees. Um, a lot of them spend a lot of time recording information, um, bragging, uh, comparing experiences rather than considering what they should be, which is about trade-offs and choices and actually making some decisions. Um, obviously, ours being the exception, uh, <laughs> sense of humor, we can have a sense of humor. Uh, what do you think the, the impact of AI will be on, on, in the boardroom and on big decisions in the exec committees? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hopeful because the first question yeah. just triggered for me this, I, I seem to spend an enormous amount of time dumbing down the technology and sticking it in a couple of PowerPoint slides to explain it to the board. And that doesn't necessarily bode well. Um, but it, it is about um, better management information. I think, I think there is still a role to have in guiding the organization, making the strategic decisions. And that's, that's the question is, would you do that in a better informed way uh, with, 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 with new types of information that have been gathered? A huge amount of the boardroom process seems to involve around lots and lots of data gathering and building KPIs, that's the piece that I think, in, in the first instance, will be, will be uh, improved. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think all, all boards are now talking about AI one way or another. Some of them, you know, when we talk to C-level execs, they do start off sometimes, rather unfortunately, saying, we want AI. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and it's kind of, ah, oh, okay, so <laughs> have you thought about what problem you want to solve with the AI, because that might be a good start. Um, so everyone's very worried about it, that's for sure. Um, I think, first of all, there has to be a mindset change, which is this isn't about AI. It's, a, it's about you know, what's your business model going to look like going forward. And like other things, you know, what are you going to invest in that's going to make you more successful than others with your business model? Or do you need to change your business model? And um, you know, then they'll make investment decisions around that. But I think the, the problem is right now that they're, they're just so caught up with the, I've got to get some of this stuff, this AI stuff. Oh. I think the boards oh. are a bit like, I think the boards are maybe a bit parental in the do as I say, not as I do mm. stance, yeah. right? They, ex they expect the executives to figure out AI exactly. and use it. I'm not sure they're 
planning on doing anything themselves. There's no, there's no question that you know, there's a lot of AI hype. I was, facilitating, I was giving a talk in an AGM of a PE group yesterday night, and you know, the, the partners the day before said, could you make sure to mention both AI and blockchain? Because it's the concluding. <laughs> <laughs> I kid That's you not. Answer. I yeah. kid you not. Start with it. Uh, and they said, good, 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 because I did have two slides. <laughs> and although the point was that they by themselves were not you know, what's going to drive value, but it is the reconfiguration strategy, blah, blah, blah. They didn't care about that. They wanted the term used. Mm. So they were very happy that way. Uh, the concern I think that, that I have there is that if we speak about AI, rather than speaking about the changes in business models, in org design, in how the organization works, we're not going to go anywhere. Right. We will start being mature when we stop being excited about AI. And when we say, ah, one of the things that used to give us stability is no longer there, how are we going to add value? In as much as on the board, the discussion focuses around AI, the company does not, has not yet passed the threshold of enlightenment, but is it, the it, quick it, way that I, therein, I'd put it. Therein lies an agency problem, because a bit of a sweeping statement, the most senior people in an organization are the ones who are older, closer to yeah. retirement, so wholly not incentivized at all to make the necessary right. organizational changes that Absolutely. are going to be required. So it will be disruptive and bloody when it comes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Could I just ask the panel what they think of the notion of a future society being made up of people who choose to work and those who choose not to work and those who choose not to work being paid the universal wage. And I know two things. One, you know, Finland are trying it. I think they've just stopped doing that now as an experiment. And I'll also note that I was in this room two weeks ago and the economists here didn't see it. I guess I'll take it. I, one, I would say I would leave it in the Royal Society's good hands. They're doing a, a kind of a Royal Society of Art, sorry, they're doing a kind of year-long study of it. And it looked like their initial hypothesis was universal basic income from what I read. But they're going to do a year-long piece of work on it as well, so what that looks like. Um, and then secondly, I think um, really basically kind of a little bit of behavioral economics, you know, most of our kind of material gains give us, what, a three-month boost in satisfaction? You know, and then we kind of go back to our normal levels of satisfaction. So I wouldn't underestimate kind of the individual's, you know, desires um, to, to and, and again, and, you know, not just the material and kind of wanting a wage, but also some all, all the other things that, you know, the workplace provides people. Um, and I, I think we're so bad at predicting what we like as individuals. I wouldn't mm. tr trust an individual <laughs> that says Lots, I wouldn't yeah. work. Yeah. Lots you know? of utopias are founded on this principle. Yeah. Keynes was thinking that since we'll have enough material world, we'll be sitting on our back. I really think that that's uh, endearing to us as human beings, entirely uh, unable to describe how we operate as human beings. Mm. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend much time thinking that's, that's likely. It's just a bias. We may have the time for uh, one more question here, second row. And one of the things, Christine, you said that's a pretty obvious place to start is that humans should come out on top when we're thinking about AI. Of course, when you think about us as humans, that's not really how we behave. If we mm. put bots out there, people teach it to swear and be racist rather than do anything <laughs> useful. Um, I can imagine a world where... Um, AI falls into the hands or is in the hands of criminals. What are they doing with it? You know, when we as yeah. business owners are running AI, are we really balancing profit versus human, human benefit? I can see lots of things to be scared of. I'm wondering what scares you guys most. <laughs> <laughs> we'll end with well, another question. <laughs> In the near term, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually more worried about the um, overhyping of, of, of the technology. Um, so it feels like we're a very, very long way away from that. But, there are, but already there are cautionary tales as we, as we embrace this new technology. We see it when we're training neural networks and training AI, the, the, the inherent biases that we get and, 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 and identify. So if it makes us more conscious of that in the short term, maybe that's, that's no, no bad thing. But uh, longer term, it's really hard to see the path by which we get to either utopia or an utterly dystopian future. Uh, we just need to be aware as we, as we move along that path. I'll say two things. One is, um, so, you know, we and government and academics are working very, very hard on this question of kind of dual 
you know, dual use, right, malicious use of things that were intended for one area and not another. And I think everybody now recognizes that the kind of, again, traditional structures, pardon me, of kind of ethics committees and ethics reviews don't always do what they were meant to do, and it's a little bit hard to stay ahead. And secondly, I will worry about the singularity when my printer can talk to my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a little bit of, we're clever, and we build clever machines, but. I'm talking about you behind your back, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Lib, sorry. <laughs> no, I think, no, I think it reminds me a bit of the uh, Jurassic Park quote, where it's, you know, your scientists were so wrapped up in working out whether you could do this without thinking about, you know, whether you should do it. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, at some point, this whole area of regulation is going to come to a head. At some point, something will happen. You know, I guess it's analogous to Facebook and misuse of data there. I mean, I, I think we, we have to work out what, what we should be doing with it. And I think everything we do should be ruled by, you know, is, is it really going to create something better for us in the future as humans? And we just have to hope that the people that make those decisions are the people that have the right ethics to do so. Uh, let me take one final uh, uh, question uh, before we, uh, we end. And right. Um, hi, thanks a lot for the discussion. Um, I had a question around competitive landscape in an AI, in an AI revolution. How do, you how do you see, um, do you see the current leaders in, dif in different sectors adapting and still staying on the top? Or do you see this as a tipping point for tech companies or startups to come in and become market leaders. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you think you know, incumbents will still be on the top, how do you identify the companies um, who would be able to adapt in this world? Presumably your clients do very well? Our, our clients do extremely well, yeah, very <laughs> successful. Um, look, I think, I think it's a little bit, you know, and I'm sure that um, uh, you would have a, a, sort of a similar view as you're sort of valuing companies. Um, those companies that are investing in uh, steam engines rather than horses are likely to be the ones that are more successful. You've got to, you've got to think about, if they're not thinking about it, they're not making the right investments, and if they're not getting a business advantage from using the technology, um, then you've got to wonder what the hell they're doing. Um, so, so I think it's really that. I think it will influence you know, investment decisions. Those companies that don't move forward will fall away. Um, and um, you know, because they just will not be competitive. And, and I think it's as simple as that. I think it is simply a steam engines versus horses debate, in my, I, in my opinion. I took your question to be a little different. Let me try to answer that may or may not be the way that, that you intended it. And that is the market structure in AI. And it's a fascinating question. We don't know much. The early indications are not optimistic. Uh, what we know is Amazon, Google, and Facebook have had this significant advance not only because they made big investments, but also because they've managed to gather the people that are actually going to help them. And if you look at the enterprise part of the market of AI, they clearly dominate. I mean, you know, I'm sure. Oh, the AI market, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. So uh, I am a little concerned about the dominance of some of the same firms that are creating webs of relationships that give them inordinate power and that embed them selectively in uh, goods and services. That is part of another concern that I have more broadly, which is that we need to rethink what market power means. I think that traditional economics has not given us a good enough way of understanding how some firms create bottlenecks and then have, again, an inordinate amount of power. But you know that's something that I think is happening in a number of sectors. Now, going to, to AI, the question there is, is it going to be you know what uh, in, in, in economics, it would call Schumpeter type one versus type two. Will the small entrepreneurial <coughs> firms be able to dominate? Will the big ones internalize innovation? Unfortunately, so far, the latter is, <coughs> appears to be the case. And the reason is that uh, the companies that grow, grow in order to be sold and yes, purchased yes. by the big ones. That takes us to other societal problems, which we may or may not want to do. By the way, most of the growth <coughs> of these firms that I mentioned is driven by absorbing and eating up all the interesting innovation by handsomely paying people with stocks once they grow. Um, we have built a society that rewards the performance on the basis of either IPO or corporate uh, um, 
uh, buyouts. It may have worked. It is creating more inequality. I think that that is raising some interesting uh, questions. If anything, regulation is pushing us, pushing this bias even more in this direction. So the subtle picture that I paint is there are many people who can have great ideas, great entrepreneurship, and develop stuff. I see the incentives for them to be gobbled up by the bigger players, and I see evidence of that happening. Unless we change our approach, then uh, that will continue. So we need to start pushing our thinking in uh, this direction. But I don't know what uh, the rest I, of the I, panel I tend will to think, say. Similarly to Michael, um, that there's this temptation to think that this is going to be a great environment for new startups with disruptive, disruptive business <coughs> models and disruptive technologies. Um, one of the interesting aspects of this is the speed of uh, distribution and the speed of change. And it, and it actually means that scale itself just becomes a barrier to entry. Yeah. So, so, so it's very hard to imagine people being able to compete with the Googles and the Amazons of the world. Okay. Not least of all because they're also creating the, the infrastructure yes. that, that supports everything. So again, Amazon are not so successful because of their brand or their retailing. They're successful because they've created the whole web service infrastructure that's fueling this and, 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 and it's hard to imagine anybody being able to come in at scale. The excitement with AI and with some of the leaders may create a world which we may or may not like, but also raises important questions. And important questions I think that we raised overall. Uh, and we went from AI, is it real, is it not, what does it uh, constitute uh, of, how will it affect uh, the white collar jobs? going from the impact on professions, the impact in the business models and organizational structures of the people that are there, the impact of knowledge and learning, the impact of the way that careers will be managed, and managed to do that in just over an hour. So uh, thank you very much <laughs> for your patience. But mostly, if you could please join me in thanking the panel for an amazing time.